Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this conversation. This is the second webinar in a series uh, brought to you by Instructure and Harbinger Group. Today, we are going to talk about the important topic of driving student engagement through NextGen LMS. My name is Rahul Singh. I'm a senior director at Harbinger Group. Uh, I've been in the e-learning industry for close to around 18 years now. I'm joined by my colleague, Ulas, who will be the co-host for today's webinar. Hey, Ulas, good morning. How are you? Hi, Rahul. Good morning. Happy to be here. So just for the audience, uh, my name is Ulas. I have been in the education industry for about 20 years. Uh, I've worked with uh, education institutes and corporates to you know, implement and leverage uh, technology for better and enhanced uh, education. Happy to be here for this webinar on uh, student engagement. I think the last one that we had was uh, uh, revolutionizing uh, education. So you know, one part of that is digitization. And I think the next important thing is uh, student engagement. So happy to be here as a co-host. Uh, look forward. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Lars. And with that, let me welcome our panelists for today. We have Paul from Instructure as our first panelist. Uh, good morning, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us today. Good morning, Rahul. Nice to see you again. Um, I really enjoyed the previous webinar we've done together. Um, and it's always a pleasure to, to be here with the Harbinger Group. Um, just for um, everyone that is new and um, has not seen the previous webinar, I can see that Kumudini so kindly shared the link to the first webinar. It's a series. Um, but uh, let me first introduce myself. My name is Paul Bacano. I am based in Australia, and I am the Global Channel Marketing Manager here at Instructure. Thank you. Thank you once again, Paul, for taking the time out for this. And now let me welcome Pooja. Pooja is also joining us from Instructure. Good morning, Pooja. How are you doing today? Hi, good morning, Rahul. Good morning, Olhas. Uh, morning, Paul. Excited to be here today to talk to you guys about something that I'm super uh, passionate about, student engagement. So a little bit about me. I am Regional Director for South Asia here at Instructor. So I take care of the India region, including some of the other parts of Southeast Asia. Um, and I've been in the ed tech industry for about five, six years now. And one of the key things that, you know, really got me into this industry was to really make sure that students keep having better experiences while, you know, uh, more better than uh, we did when we were students. So uh, yeah, excited to hear, be here and share my knowledge with you guys. Thank you, Pooja. You very aptly said, put, put up this point that, you know, a better experience than what we had. You know, uh, those were different days. Uh, today, we are living in a digital first era and uh, student engagement uh, you know, becomes a pretty important uh, aspect in the digital era. So having said that, I think uh, this is a good time to check the pulse of the audience in terms of what they feel about student engagement. So uh, in a moment, you will have a poll on your screen. I'll I'm just launching the poll. So you can select uh, multiple answers for this poll. The question is, in your opinion, what are the two key attributes of student engagement in a blended learning environment? A blended learning environment, wherein you have face-to-face, uh, -face, offline uh, teaching and learning, as well as online teaching and learning. So we look forward to your thoughts on this one. Uh, please feel free to select multiple choices. Yeah, we see some uh, you know, uh, responses coming in. Thank you very much for your participation. We'll keep it uh, open for another 20 seconds or so, and then we'll close the poll and share the results. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll close the poll now. And you should be able to see the results on your screens. I think a clear winner is fine balance of 
synchronous and asynchronous delivery. So that's what the audience feels. And the second one is optimum student and faculty interaction. So those two are where the audience have voted the most. And uh, we'll remember these points. So uh, we'll discuss on these particular points, specific points in our discussion ahead. And uh, thank you once again for participating in this poll. Right, so uh, with the poll behind us, let's, let's move into the discussion. And I think uh, to begin with, firstly, I think most of us would agree, and even the poll results showed that, that we all believe that student engagement is important in today's digital era. But what does student engagement means? And there could be multiple aspects to it. What we have done is we have just put together a few specific points. For example, student and faculty interactions. That's one of the most important aspects of driving student engagement. Employment-focused learning, there's so much focus on you know, preparing students for the jobs of future, the future of workplace. Action-oriented learning, so it cannot be just theoretical learning, but action-oriented learning. Then helping students overcome academic challenges. Not every student has the equal capability or ability, so we need to address their academic challenges. And then from a faculty perspective, measurable learning outcomes. That's, that's an important criteria to have. And uh, at the end of it, uh, we are social animals. So we like to collaborate with each other, learn from each other, share with each other. So social and collaborative learning. So these are some of the important aspects that we put together. I mean, please feel free to, for the audience, please feel free to type in the chat box and share your thoughts if there are any other aspects that you feel important. And uh, I would also request Paul and Pooja to share some of their thoughts on some of these aspects or if they feel any differently about this. Um, I can share first. So, you know, you're you're very aptly um, summarized that some of these things are especially the solo, uh, social and collaborative learning aspect of, of uh, driving student engagement in, in a digital era. Um, this is actually um, in line with some of the research that Instructure has actually done. So every year Instructure actually runs a study we call it the state of student success and engagement in higher education. And some of the results of our study have actually proven exactly that. So 51% of uh, the most impactful engagement strategies involve actually hands-on learning and experience-based learning models uh, compared to previous years, pre-pandemic. So, so that I think like a lot of what you're saying is definitely um, very much evident in all the research that we've done on our side as well. Yeah, totally. And um, if I can pick up on that um, point, what when, when we think about, let's take a step back, if, when we think about the student experience, right? So um, very, very well pointed, Raku, not every student is the same. I mean, we're not robots in here, you know, um, and some students have a better aptitudes than others uh, in specific uh conditions and and especially in terms of uh, conditions of learning right the way that they want to uh, be taught um the when they the way that they best absorb some are doers versus others are more critical thinkers um and others um you know require more interaction some less I mean, from the faculty, for university, from the educator, from the lecturer, from the uh, assistant lecturers and everyone else in, and tutors involved. Now, when we look at the results of this poll, it's, it's evident that those are some of the top of mind. And what does that mean is the way that we deliver that content must be catered as wide as possible. And then through different means, possible um, so that we can enable all of those different types of learners to absorb it as best as possible. Second one, I think absolutely the interaction, right? So when when you have, when I studied, okay, it was only one LMS and 
gauging by my obvious years, you can probably figure it out which one it was. Um, but it was horrible. It was kind of like, here's some PowerPoint slides, go through them and see you later, right? Um, and there was no way of providing any feedback. There was no interaction. My interaction was just pretty much to go to uni and complain to my to my tutors and my faculties. Um, and I think that also is, um, is a major change nowadays, um, especially since the advent of social media where students nowadays, and not only students, because I don't know if you know that most adopters of Facebook in the last five years have actually been the older generation. So Facebook's kind of washed their hands on you know, the young kids, they're all on Instagram now. But when it comes to Facebook, it's more the mass and past. My mom is sending me all the time stuff on Facebook. It's like, oh my God, have you seen this thing? I'm like, yeah, mom, but please hold it. Um, and then finally, and I think it's a very fine line, we didn't mention it, was the feedback mechanism, right? So the feedback mechanism it can also be something like you're doing online quizzes. You're immediately able to get a grade on your assessment. And for me, if I was going back to university, that would be, again, one of the most important things because they would say, uh, I, I have, and like everyone else has, you know, you go into an exam thinking, oh my God, I'm going to ace this. And then you have to wait for a few weeks to find out that you kind of got a C plus. Right, so um, with with a really good LMS or any other interaction, we'll be able to immediately give you some feedback. Uh, no, Paul, you're not as smart as you think you are. Go back and study. Okay, fine. I'm not going to go play my soccer with my mates. I'm actually going to do a little bit more study to actually prepare me for the real important exam, which is at the end of the semester. Right. Thank you, thank you, Paul, for sharing your thoughts there. I think. Yeah, I just want, I just want to chip in the whole that uh, there is another challenge, which is uh, not so much for the students, but I think it's for the faculty and the administrators, which is to come up with the best blend of blended learning. You know, it came up synchronous versus asynchronous. I think that's a big challenge in terms of to mix the right blend to ensure that you know the student engagement happens. I think that's a point that uh, uh, is important. Yeah, thanks. Absolutely, Ulas. You, you brought up a pretty valid point, and I think uh, we will definitely be discussing around that particular aspect. And uh, Paul, uh, the feedback mechanism, uh, absolutely, that, that's a must to have. In terms of driving student engagement, feedback mechanism is uh, definitely a very important aspect. And um, the number that you quoted, Pooja, that's a uh, pretty you know significant number, 51% hands-on learning, experiential learning. So that kind of explains in itself. And um, you know, on a side note, Paula, thank you for bringing up that Facebook, Instagram example. That reminds me that I need to get on uh, Instagram as quickly as possible because I need to pretend that I'm still on the younger side of the fence. So yeah, sooner than later. All right. So yeah, uh, thank you once again. So I think uh, we've spoken about the importance of student engagement in a digital era. We touched upon uh, a certain aspects of this. With that, uh, I think uh, one of the important aspects uh, that is coming out in this discussion is the, eventually it's, it's between the interaction between the students and faculties, whether it's the interactions are happening synchronously or asynchronously. That's an important uh, aspect of this entire student engagement. So with that, let's let's uh, take an audience poll in on, on this particular topic. Right, and so on your screens, uh, you'll be getting the second poll. I'll be launching it uh, soon. So again, uh, again, you can select multiple uh, answers to this particular question. And the question is, in your opinion, what are the two key factors that can be a blocker for driving student engagement in a blended learning environment? You should have the polls on your screen by now. Mm -hmm. 
we see some uh, responses coming in. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your thoughts on this one. Right, we'll keep it open for another 10 seconds or so, and then we'll share the results. All right, so let's uh, close the poll and let's let's see what the audience poll says. Right, so 71% of the audience feels that the disconnect between the synchronous and asynchronous learning material is a key blocker. And the second one uh, is 57% uh, of the audience feels that unavailability of collaboration tools during synchronous sessions. And then at 50%, we have downtime or unable to access the asynchronous learning materials. So these three come out as the most critical aspects. Right. Thank you very much for participating in this poll. We'll definitely touch upon these particular topics in our discussion ahead. Right. So let's let's move ahead in our conversation. And let's <clears throat> talk about uh, some of the teaching strategies or some of the best practices to foster student engagement in a blended learning environment. I think one of the key aspects of a blended learning environment is it has to have the synchronous aspect as well as asynchronous aspect. The secret sauce or the recipe is, and as the poll, poll suggested, that a fine blend between the asynchronous material and the synchronous material. Right. So if you look at this diagram on the next slide, this kind of explains about that blend. So at the center of it, we have the student engagement concept and we engage the students on three axes. One is on the behavioral side. Second is on the emotional side and third is on the cognitive side. And then there has to be a fine balance and a connect between the asynchronous material and the synchronous material. For example, if someone has done a particular, has gone through a particular lecture in a synchronous uh, learning environment, the reinforcement learning material or the assessments or the quizzes need to connect with that synchronous learning experience. The asynchronous learning material cannot be different. I think that's what the poll also suggested that you know the disconnect between the synchronous and asynchronous learning material could be a blocker for student engagement. And the way we redesign or redefine the course structure, the continuity that we have to maintain through a semester, and that should include the hands-on learning experience as Puja was suggesting. You know, so making connections with the, between the synchronous, asynchronous activities, diversifying the activities through the semester, bringing in hands-on learning experience. And above all, since we are saying that, you know, this is anytime, anywhere access for students, the downtime has to be at a minimal. Because if a student comes up at a particular point and says that, all right, this is my time, I'll go in and do an assignment or I'll take an assessment or I'll revisit the lecture. And if at that point of time, uh, the material is not accessible to a particular student, the possibility is pretty high for that student to get disengaged. So this, this is how we kind of, uh, you know, ensuring a sustained pace throughout the course, because it's not about, a, it's, it's, not a, it's not like corporate learning, right? Where you get into a classroom training environment, you go through a one-day program or a two-day program, you come out with student learning material or handouts. It's all about a semester. You have to keep the learners engaged, students engaged over a long period of time. I think uh, uh, I'll, I'll request Ulas to share some of his thoughts uh, on, on you know, what you feel about the fine balance between synchronous, asynchronous, and what does it all means in terms of driving student engagement? 
Yeah, Rahul, you've covered it well, but uh, I'll just probably highlight a couple of things. One is, I think, when you use this com combination, uh, you know, one uh, one is what we call as the flipped classroom, you know, where the asynchronous stuff, you know, it, it flips the entire model. You know, that asynchronous stuff comes first, you know, so there is a lot of online conceptual learning that the student goes through uh, before they come into the classroom where they actually apply what they have learned. So that is uh, one aspect. The second aspect is of reinforcement. You know, so what they have learned in the classroom when they go back, then there is something you know which they can work on and you know do projects or do some application to reinforce what they have learned in the class classroom. You know, so I think these two aspects, the classroom and uh, reinforced learning, that kind of uh, adds to it. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Yes, absolutely. The flipped classroom uh, is, is a pretty, pretty relevant one in the blended learning environment. So, uh, Pooja, any thoughts that you want to share on this particular aspect, the student faculty interaction, the connection between synchronous, asynchronous? I think you and Olhas have covered quite a bit of it. I, I think that that's definitely um, well addressed. Right. Thank you. Paul, any thoughts on uh, the student engagement uh, driving through three particular uh, axes, the behavioral, emotional, cognitive uh, side of things? And how does the technology or the you know, digital tools like a next-gen LMS kind of help drive this? Yeah, certainly. Um, it's very well pointed. Um, again, going back to that idea that you know students are not these machines like dumpster bins you put stuff into their minds and then uh, expect them to regurgitate in exams. I think we're well beyond and past that uh, teaching um, methodology. And I think this is where the next uh, LMS really comes into play. And to give you a, a few examples of this, <clears throat> if you take it as a, um, just as a repository of assets and then Here's your homework versus an LMS that actually enables, again, that communication, that interaction, that uh, feedback loop. Plus, it talks the language of the students. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, we've identified a very long time ago and kind of before the TikTok and the Reels trend actually kicked off was we have um canvas studio which enables the students to actually create their own videos right something that again talks to their language they uh students nowadays you know they, they love doing reels they feel empowered by creating a video of themselves talking um and then on top of that within canvas you can even communicate via facebook <laughs> So um, again, it's it's uh, enabling the students to um, feel heard, giving them back that cognitive um, reassurance that they are important, and that um, that drives the behavioral change. You will see that once students feel empowered, they feel more passionate about whatever they're studying and that delivers more engagement and better results and finally creating that emotional connection i can speak probably for all of us in this virtual room that if you want to record one of your happiest memories of uh, school it's probably that one that 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 one professor or teacher or educator that made you feel special you know uh for me i was in my uh chemistry class and i had the option of actually doing my own science experiment like actually putting some sodium in water and like nearly exploded and stuff and that really sparked my passion about science, you know, and, and ever since then, even though I'm marketing, but I'm a massive science nerd. So I can even explain to you how, uh, how rockets get into space. That, this is how deep I got into, because of that experience, that emotional experience that I had back in high school. And I think it was year seven or something like that. Thank you, Paul. Uh, 
Thank you, Paul, for sharing this. I think uh, you mentioned a very uh, important aspect, student empowerment. If you allow them to express themselves, if you empower them, then they are prone to be more emotionally connected. Uh, there's a comment uh, in the chat box from an audience which says asynchronous activities should include collaborative learning. Absolutely, I think uh, the next gen LMSs should have features like this because when you are doing things offline and at that point of time, if you are able to do peer to peer collaboration, that definitely fuels the engagement. Uh, just one quick request to the audience if you feel that you know, there's something which you want to share. Please feel free to, you know, raise your hands uh, through the Zoom. There's a feature there and we'll unmute you and you can come in and share your thoughts. So we definitely want this to be as collaborative and as interactive as possible. You're empowered. <laughs> right. Right. So, all right. So we touched upon the importance of or the important acts aspects of student engagement. And then, and then we specifically called out the student and faculty interaction and how the synchronous and asynchronous has to blend together. Now we'll move ahead into our conversation and we will focus on the next gen LMS, which we are talking about today. Uh, and <clears throat> primarily what I'm going to request is, I'm going to request Paul, and then after, of course, Pooja to discuss and share with us as to how Instructor can help specifically in driving student engagement. What are some of those features or aspects of this next-gen LMS? And by next-gen, I mean truly a next-gen LMS that can help drive student engagement and help us overcome some of these challenges. So, uh, Paul Puja, the stage is all yours. Please feel free to go ahead and share your thoughts and, you know. We can move to the next slide probably. I'm happy to pick this one up. <clears throat> so this is, um, this is what we call a squid graph. And it just shows the different elements out there, right? Um, and if you have a look in here, there's only one that has a linear progression in terms of growth um, and quite staggering, actually. Um, we started um, Canvas back in 2008 with one goal in mind, and that was reach, accessibility, and that's what we started it as a cloud first, cloud native, if you want to call it like that, and open LMS. And ever since then, we have grown, uh, as you can see in there, um, to, to, to a remarkable degree. But the one thing that we kind of touched up during this uh, webinar, and that is the feedback mechanism. Pooja mentioned the different customer case studies and, and different deep insights that we do here at Instructure. And we talk to real people, real students, and real faculties to actually produce that content. Uh, please visit our website. It's got a lot about this, uh, this kind of um, content. Now, another thing that I wanted to point out, if you have a look at the more legacy LMSs and how they're dwindling, how they're dying off, uh, the number one, uh, which is the one that I mentioned earlier that I used when I was at university, is continuously shrinking um, because they're not as customer obsessed as we are. Um, and I think if, if, if you're not customer obsessed uh, in, in this day and age and, and you don't listen to your customers, uh, be it the student, the faculty, the teachers, even the even the parents, you're not going to be surviving long. That's pretty much my message <laughs> for for this slide. Um, any other comments, Puja or Rahul? Mumas? 
No, uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. You, you rightly said, I think uh, the <clears throat> LMS scenario globally is going through a paradigm shift and uh, the legacy LMSs, which are merely a container through which you can access digital learning material are struggling. And that's, that's true across the globe because LMS is now no more a container to host digital learning material. It's a tool which can enable students, empower students and faculties and administrators and parents to take control of their learning activities, their teaching activities. And of course, there's a big part that data and analytics play these days because you know, if, if you have the ability to capture the data in the right manner and run analytics and create sensible uh, reports out of it that can actually tell you the progress. So we spoke about measurable learning outcomes as one of the important aspects of driving student engagement. I mean, I as a student or as an individual would like to know how am I, how am I doing, whether I'm doing good, am I doing average or am I doing bad? I mean, I need feedback. And, and today we are talking about millennials, Gen Zs, and I think they call the next one the Gen Alphas. They want instant feedback on how they are doing, how they are progressing, and not just about themselves. They want to know how they are doing in a group, how they are doing amongst their peers. So, you know, this, this graph definitely kind of says something about LMSs, which are able to keep up with the changing demands of the learners and faculties today. And those who are not, I think uh, Nokia is a classic example uh, or Kodak for that matter is a classic example who could not keep up pace with the changing demands of uh, uh, the industry or the market. So you very aptly put, uh, I just wanted to share these thoughts. Uh, Pooja Lars, please feel free to share yours if you want to. Any. All right, so uh, we'll move ahead in the conversation. And now I think uh, I'll request Pooja to specifically talk about a few features uh, which the Canvas LMS has through which we can drive student engagement. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Rahul. So, you know, obviously throughout our conversation, it's been really um, evident that one of the key things that um, obviously having an LMS provides to uh, uh, institution within teaching and learning is consistency. Having a consistent, uh, you know, kind of portal for all their different types of users uh, builds a foundation for them to, you know, improve the quality and scale of instruction. And by having these consistent experiences through classes and academic terms, they can then also be better learners themselves. So it builds a foundation for digital learning, which kind of helps them centralize all their you know online learning tools into one place and so the students can focus on the content and they don't focus on so much of the technology that's getting them there and that's kind of one of the key reasons why canvas has been so successful is we have made it a very easy place for you to put everything inside um, it helps students with different types of disabilities be that being you know visual learning etc all of them to be able to still leverage technology in a similar way even though they might not have this the right skill sets for that um, and then one of the key things that you know we've been talking a lot about was that we are catering to a new type of learner. We are catering to young people who are constantly looking for feedback and the kind of uh, you know information constantly at their reach. So we do are are one of the few people that have a native app. We do have a very um, similar experience across our web and mobile apps that allow you to have that uh, ability to, you know, make sure that the learner is being reached. 
Um, again, within all of these things, clear communication with the students is our, one of our key tenants. And we allow not just the students, but also obviously, most importantly, the faculty to be able to contextualize key in, uh, interactions with students through different uh, means that be that, uh, you know, uh, assignments, discussions, etc., to be able to give them the different variations of the type of media that they they want to represent their thoughts in. So I, I think that what it, it ends up doing is that it meets all the needs, different needs of students and lets them express in the, themselves in the different ways that they find themselves most effective. Um, we can move on to the next slide. So Canvas itself by itself is not just, uh, you know, um, um, helpful. We also in, acknowledge that video is an important part of learning these days. And the way that Canvas really incorporates uh, learning content into really turning it into a conversation is probably the best way I would put it. So, you know, we're helping people turn passive watching into active learning. We're helping all the learners, you know, uh, reach every um, reach all of them in case, you know, one of them, they, they don't have uh, the ability to understand the accent. So we have the ability with our technology to turn on one click captioning that allows them to, you know, create auto captions. We're also, you know, allowing them um, to be able to use videos in unexpected ways, uh, in different ways, so that they can also break up like text heavy discussions into different types of uh, responses that probably create more engaging experiences for them. Um, and then, you know, one of the last things that obviously we want uh, a, a tool like Studio to do is create just better uh, deeper thinking uh, and and you know really understanding the what they are learning uh, in, in a more uh, contextual manner and, and really trying to drive as much um, productivity out of that experience um, and then also just relating that entire experience back to the uh, faculty members. So being able to see, you know, where the students are dropping off, where exactly they are, you know, uh, really engaging with, where where they've actually commented the most on. These are type of things that, you know, are valuable to the faculty member to understand is, is the type of content that I am engaging with my students with really creating that feedback loop that I want to have. So, so having technology that allows you to be flexible in that aspect really, really drives this engagement. And then lastly, we do have tools that incorporate all of these learning experiences in, into a way that helps you leverage your online program offering in the best way possible by creating, you know, real-time insights of how many students are purchasing your courses, how you can, you know, group your courses through different catalogs, and then be able to offer uh, best, but better professional development to your own faculty members to be able to, you know, improve the way that they are teaching as well. Thank you, thank you, Pooja. If you don't mind, I want to pick on a few particular aspects, and uh, you know, uh, probably we'll try and go a little deeper onto those aspects. If we go to the video slide, please. Uh, that's that's a very important uh, aspect of it because a lot of it. A lot of content, digital content, is being consumed in a video format these days. And um, to be honest, these are TikTok days. So videos can be pretty boring uh, when it comes to watching lengthy videos. So the possibility is pretty high of students getting disengaged in videos. So mm -hmm. this particular aspect in terms of create engaging interactive videos. So does it mean that you know uh, the administrator or a faculty can use this LMS and embed quizzes, add captions, uh, you know, uh, screen capture and bring in interactive elements in the existing videos? Is that what it primarily means, this feature? Yes, absolutely. So you could essentially have a student be watching a video and while they're watching that video, take a pause in the video and then have them answer a multiple choice or a discussion question. Uh, basically give them different uh, reference points at the videos where you are interacting with them. Uh, and that includes, you know, obviously being able to add captions at different points in the videos as well, if you want them to be looking at additional information beyond that. 
that. Um, and again, you know, if this involves you screen capturing your own video to incorporate in, into this quiz, you can do that as well with, with, with our uh, platform capabilities. Thank you. That, that, that's a wonderful feature. And uh, this particular point was pretty intriguing to me in terms of the analytics that you provide. So, of course, one part is who's watched the video and for how long, and then which parts. So can those analytics give us a comparative analysis that, okay, these particular students or set of students have watched this particular part for this long, but mm -hmm. there are these X number of students who have dropped off on these particular video sections, which means this particular section of that video is not engaging enough or it's a point wherein students are dropping. And then can the faculty or the administrator go and, you know, edit those parts and ensure that, you know, they are more engaging so that the students don't drop off at that point. Uh, is that a possibility? Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's exactly what you said. Uh, we use it in exact same format to make sure that even faculty members, they have a exact like uh, pinpoint way of identifying what what's working for them and what's not. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pooja. That's that's very interesting. And uh, Paul, I wanted to go back to the first slide, the feature slide. And I wanted to pick your brains a little bit on the uh, accessibility part. So what, what kind of, uh, uh, at Canvas as an organization at Instructure, what made the organization believe that, you know, it should be, there should be total accessibility, both for faculties and students and, uh, you know, to bring in the equity in the learning. So what was the thought process behind that? Um, very good point. The decision was made, I said from the very beginning, to go cloud native, uh, cloud, uh, cloud first, and also open source. And I love the way that you put it, faculty as well as students. And for that is, let's break it down into what does, um, what does faculty mean? Um, and that is obviously the teachers, the educators, the professors. They, that means it opens up a whole world, literally, the whole planet that you can bring in, you know, guest lectures. Uh, for example, you, you have a, um, a lecture and you want to bring someone from MIT, from the United States, or you want to bring someone from, um, you know, uh, any other country, you can do that. Um, and an, another, another option is, as we've seen in the pandemic, Everyone was scrambling, not knowing what's going on. We had lockdowns. It was it was really terrible time to be in, um, and um, it really opened up the opportunity for the continuation of education. Something that really made me sad today, um, and I think it's terrible. It's I saw that the Taliban in Afghanistan actually are banning women to go to university. Now, if I was in Afghanistan, I will do whatever I can to get my daughter online through uh, Starlink or through the mobile phone or through my, uh, you know, if I have a mobile phone, something to continue her education incognito. And I think, I, and look, quote me on this if you want, we're going to see that happening, even in countries such as Afghanistan. Um, now, that level of accessibility is only empowering people. Um, and second, let's talk about, you mentioned Generation Z and Alphas. They're born with a mobile phone in their face, right? So um, we've invested so much in making the experience on the device as a mobile phone as good or even better than what you get on a desktop. Uh, mobile adoption has gone through the roof um, and be it um, the pandemic being uh, people being stupid or um, that create policies or regional accessibility, right? You can reach anyone in the world nowadays um, with a mobile phone. Uh, so that brings, again, the empowerment to, uh, back to the students. And finally, with an open system, with an open, um, open source system such as ours, 
cares as well for the unseen and unheard of heroes of faculty, which are your IT department, your systems admins, your the people that actually keep the lights on, right? So what if if we at the instructor can do something to empower them as well, to make their life easier, to do integrations with their sims, uh, student information management systems, uh, to existing tech stack that they may have already. Isn't that awesome? I think it is. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for uh, uh, sharing your thoughts there. Definitely, I totally agree. I think we, we spoke a lot about students and faculties, and that's an important aspect of it. But uh, you rightly mentioned the people who keep lights open. Uh, you know, we should take care of them as well, because eventually there's a lot happens in the background. Uh, when, you know, let's say there's there's a educational institute with a student strength of around 20,000 odd people. Imagine the kind of efforts that go into the background to keep the operations running and smooth. So making things easier for them is also pretty important. So thank you once again, Paul and Pooja for sharing some of these features uh, in the Canvas LMS that can help us drive student engagement. And for the audience, if you have any particular questions or if you want any specific information on any particular feature, please feel free to reach out to us or to Paul and Pooja directly, and uh, they'll be more than happy to answer your questions. And uh, with that, uh, I wanted to kind of uh, ask you a question, Pooja, that you know, we spoke about these features, but I think it might be wonderful for us to know a few customer cases or stories wherein some of these features have helped them achieve the desired objectives or drive the student engagement. Absolutely. Happy to pick that one up, Pooja, uh, if you want. Yeah, um, I, I was going to say Paul can speak to this one because he's actually talked to Yogesh himself. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was uh, very fortunate. Uh, thank you, Pooja. Uh, I was very fortunate to 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 have uh, conversed with uh, uh, Madame Yogesh and um, learn more about uh, their experience. You can obviously read for the text, but my main topics um, of, of this testimonial um, that I can pick up would be, let's look at the first one, a world-class LMS that will match our quality in premium work in international education. Everyone is proud of what they do. At least I hope they do. And, you know, if you're proud, especially as an educator, to you put in all this effort, you create a curricula, you invest a lot of time and passion and money um, into building an organization that ultimately um, will bring what you think is the best quality education possible to, to your students. Don't you want the best tools? I remember one thing that my dad told me once, it's like, I'm too poor to buy cheap things, right? So when you put that into perspective, that's what you want, isn't it? From an LMS, to, 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 to without you knowing it, without your students knowing it, it's evangelizing you as an organization. Um, it's a kind of, um, uh, that's what I make it out of the first sentence. The second one is, <clears throat> It's a single platform. You don't have to muck about with, you know, 10 different systems that can and do break up down, especially when you need the most. Um, and then uh, that's why uh, an ecosystem such as Canvas, um, LMS, like an structure, makes a lot of sense. You install it once, it's open source, make, keeps the guys, the IT guys happy. Um, and then finally, uh, I want to uh, focus on the last two points, which is an, a tool of enhancement. Okay, so it's enhancing you, your organization, and your curricula, and whatever you do. Uh, and then lastly is, and help to establish us as a clear leader in courses designed to support international education curricula. So if there was no Canvas, 
obviously she could have gone from a for an LMS, but would that reach have happened at such a fast pace or not? I think with Canvas, she found the tool to go beyond her borders, beyond India. So if there's any educators in the audience that do have those aspirations, 100%, um, go for it. Uh, Canvas can and will support you to become an international superstar. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this wonderful story. And uh, I think with that, uh, we are coming towards the end of our discussion. We'll open up for the Q&A and discussion in a uh, very short while. And uh, I would, uh, now this is the time to know about Instructure as an organization, what Instructure as an organization is. So uh, Pooja, I believe uh, you're going to talk about or Paul, is it you? Happy to pick it up since I'm already on the mic. Um, so like I said, Canvas was born in the cloud um, in 2008. Um, we have a, a lot of people know us for Canvas LMS, but we have a lot more other tools uh, specifically designed for everyone in, in the faculty. So for, um, uh, for the students, uh, for uh, the IT crowd, for uh, the educators. Um, our focus is technology, innovation, and human connections. Again, re-emphasizing our absolute obsession about customer service. Okay, and what does what does that mean? We get all of that customer success or not success, which is even better. Let us know where we're failing, because that will then drive the innovation required for our technology to become better and the best. And um, the numbers speak for themselves. At the moment, we are the leading LMS in the United States and fastest growing in the world. We have tens of millions of users worldwide, over 70 countries, and thousands and thousands of institutions within those ones. And we are ranked number one in the world as the most visited education website in the world. So um, I think um, I think we've got a good partner in in Canvas. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Yes, the numbers speak for themselves. Ranked number one visited education website in the world. So if you have not yet had a chance to visit the Canvas website or the Instructure website, please do so. Uh, thank you again, Paul Puja and uh, Ulas. Uh, I will request you to please uh, share you know, a brief about Harbinger Group, who we are, what we do. Yeah, thank you, Rahul. Yeah, so I must uh, start by saying that uh, all uh, you're lucky to have Harbinger as a partner. Yeah, I think together, I think we can tell our customers that yeah, you found the best combination. Yeah, so Harbinger has been in this uh, business of e-learning for more than 30 years. So we've contributed to the evolution of e-learning uh, right from the you know, five, one, four, and three and a half inch floppy drives, and it was computer based education. And uh, since then, we have, uh, you know, set standards and, you know, contributed in a big way in uh, developing and, uh, uh, you know, enhancing customer product, be it uh, software companies or be it education institutes. And we can, bear, you know, we can boast of the best uh, product engineers and the best of instructional designers and the best of uh, solution architects. And uh, and with that, in 30 years, we have, uh, you know, uh, worked on all aspects of end-to-end -end, uh, requirements in the education life cycle. And uh, yes, uh, you know, we've, we've kind of uh, helped clients during challenging times. Pandemic uh, was one uh, occasion when, you know, companies and institutes were scrambling around. And that was the time we, uh, you know, helped them out in a big way. And uh, today, again, the challenges continue because, you know, it's time for back to classroom and therefore there are new kinds of challenges. And I think uh, the market has got matured, you know, and that is where I think a combination of, uh, you know, using world best practices and Arbinger's experience can uh, come to the fore. So look forward to more interactions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Uh, you rightly said, uh... In, in uh, you know, this combination of Instructure and Harbinger is, is a great partnership. 
and specifically for educational institutes to make them future ready and accelerate the digital transformation needs that they have. Uh, with that, uh, let me take this opportunity to thank you, uh, uh, the panelists for today, Paul, Pooja, Ulas, thank you very much for your wonderful insights. Uh, we'll open up for the Q&A, uh, or you know, not just questions, but if there are any other points that you feel are important for this particular topic, please feel free to type it in the chat box or in, in the Q&A box. We'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Yep. In the chat box, you have the LinkedIn profiles for Paul and Pooja. Please feel free to connect with them, write to them directly. Okay, there is a question in the chat box. The question is, is it chargeable? Uh, if you could please elaborate the question a bit more in terms of chargeable, in terms of... Uh, the implementation of the LMS, uh, subscription to the LMS, is that what you're referring to? All right, uh, there is a question from the audience and probably <clears throat> I'll request to Paul to talk about it because uh, uh, the question, uh, I heard of some free LMS uh, and why is Canvas better than those? Uh, can you please? I think you, uh, Rahul, your internet connection was a bit unstable. Um, but I, I, I think I think the question was um, about um, is Canvas better than some free ones? Um, we know that there are some free free LMSs, and you can take that one with some really big book marks. Um, essentially, when you talk about the free LMS, a lot of times people do tuck away conveniently a lot of the um, hidden costs that it comes with a free LMS. So say, for example, okay, you don't pay for it, but um, you have to pay for your own hosting. You have to pay for your own, um, you know, IT team, your your other software that needs to be uh, such as virtual virtualized drives um, on top of your uh, infrastructure. So say, for example, okay, you, you host it on-prem, off-prem, hybrid, um, you know, um, it, it, it all depends on your faculty and it all depends on your IT um, department. Now, when, it all, when, uh, when you factor all of those costs in, actually you'll find out that having um, solutions such as Canvas out of a box, that plays really nicely with everyone else, with all the other tech stack that you may have at your university, also comes in with integrated um, connections, you know, um, that help bridge the gap um, to your sims, to your other um, uh, tech stacks. It's actually cheaper. And not only that, but also recurring costs, for example, if you compare a website, say for example, built up in WordPress versus uh, a Wix, um, you need to constantly update that one. Uh, the same as, in the, uh, as any other piece of software like an LMS. And that can um, add costs on top of those fixed costs. These are variable costs that a lot of people don't really factor in. Um, and then to make matters worse, since the integration is haphazard and kind of works, eventually could break. And you don't want to have that um, technology break down, especially when it's most used. Um, usually computer systems do have a tendency that when they're most needed and there's a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, um, requ uh, requests for it, 
that's when they do happen to, to fail. So do factor all of those in. We're happy to talk to you about all the different pricing models that we have here. And you know, if you're not convinced, give it a shot, try for free. We do have Canvas free for teacher. And um, we'd love to hear your feedback. Yeah, thank you for that, Paul. There's another question in the Q&A. Is my data in Canvas secure? Um, Pooja, do you want to pick that one up? Sure. Um, I think like it really depends what you mean by security. Uh, is your data going to be stolen by somebody else? Uh, probably not. There's many different ways that uh, Canvas is secure. We have an entire uh, security uh, architecture that's published that you could actually uh, download and read about. We constantly have uh, external uh, parties helping us actually do penetration testing and making sure that you know our software is not uh, susceptible to uh, uh, malicious attacks, etc. Um, but if you are again uh, a teacher and you you are uh, worried about the security of your online content, etc., uh, I, I think that that also depends very much so on how you are currently distributing it. So uh, I think we can take up uh, that question separately, just so that we can better understand what is security to you, and then we can identify all the ways that Canvas meets it. Yes, there is another question. Where is Canvas hosted? A great question. So Canvas is hosted on the AWS cloud. Uh, the AWS um, country where uh, all the data for India is hosted out of is Singapore. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you, Paul. I think we are running out of time. So let's uh, move on over to you, Rahul. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your active participation audience in this webinar discussion. And uh, with that, I think uh, I'll take this opportunity to, to thank Paul and Pooja from Instructure for taking the time out for this and having this insightful conversation. Hopefully, as we said at the beginning, this is a series. Hopefully, in the new year, we'll meet again with another intriguing topic and continue this series. Thank you again, Paul Puja. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you so much for hosting us. Um, really appreciate it, Rahul. Um, and looking forward to seeing everyone in the new year. Thank you, and thank you, Ulas. Thank you very much uh, for being with us today. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Puja. Thank you. Have a great one. Bye, everyone. Happy New Bye -bye. Year. Thank you, everyone. Have a happy New Year ahead.